Welcome Dr. Mark Rutland. He has a word to share that God put on his heart. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Wow. Wow. You know how to make somebody feel welcome. Don't, don't let it out that you applaud for guest speakers like that. They'll be lining up. Choose me. Choose me. Well, it's great to be back again. This will wrap it up for me. These two Sundays were uh, happened to be a situation where I had it open, and uh, I'm uh, involved in a relationship with your board of elders or board of directors, or however, whatever the title for that is, the deacons, uh, in the search process for your new pastor. And so I thought it would be helpful um, if I knew you a little better. So I, I could, um, when I talk to candidates, whatever, then I can, I can describe you folks. And, uh, and I, I, I'm going to tell you, I've been able to tell them, this is a joyful church. This is a great spirit. And a jolly church. A jolly church. You, you, you like to laugh. I, I like that. There's so many churches that are just so... Deadly serious. <laughs> a merry heart doeth good like medicine. So I say, take your medicine like a big boy. And <laughs> so, um, what, what will be happening? So the, there will be um, a, a process of selecting a new pastor. It's not an event. It's a process. A pastor leaving is an event. Choosing the new pastor is a process. So these things, you must be patient. Wait, I say, wait on the Lord. The second thing is pray for your elders. Pray for the board. Seriously, don't just say that. Spend some time in your, in your devotions praying that God will give them wisdom and, and grace and sensitivity to his word and discernment. And the third thing is, pray for unity. Pray that God will so coalesce the spirit, that he will so bring together one mind, one heart, one spirit, that the church will just uh, move in as it is. I sense a spirit of unity. But, but when it comes to, to that kind of a, of a selection for a new leader, a new pastor, that everyone will come into a spirit of unity. And then finally, there is this. No pastor that God sends here will be perfect. I just need to make that clear. If it isn't clear, there is no, unless you can get Jesus. <laughs> now, if you can get Jesus, get him. <laughs> but uh, there'll be somebody to say, oh, you know, he's not tall enough or he's He's not a good enough preacher, or he doesn't, he doesn't do the worship right, or something. There'll be something. I promise there'll be something about the, the next pastor, whoever he is, that doesn't quite, isn't quite straight tens in every category. Close. We'll get close. But not straight tens in every category. So that's where the spirit of unity and grace will have to prevail. That you'll, you have to say, say to yourself, look in the mirror. And say, they didn't choose me, so they couldn't get somebody perfect. <laughs> if they'd have chosen you, if they, right? Isn't that right? If they'd have chosen you, they'd have had a perfect pastor. God has somebody in mind. God, God already, it's, it's, God is not confused. <laughs> we just have to get ourselves out of the tunnel. But God has somebody in mind. Amen? Amen. Understandest thou these things? If you have your Bibles, if you'll take those and turn, if you will, to the book of Zechariah. Who's, who, who's controlling the lights? Can you, can you put lights on my Bible? If that's, is that possible? No? Turn to your neighbor and say, this guy's so old he can't read. <laughs> if you have your Bibles, if you'll take those and turn to the book of Zechariah. The book of Zechariah. 
It is an infrequently read book, unfortunately. In fact, it's so infrequently that I see some of you thumbing through the pages. If you go to Genesis and turn right, you're going to be a while. If you'll go to Matthew and turn left, go to Matthew and turn left and drive slow. There's only a single stoplight. You'll go right through Zechariah. But it's a powerful little book. There are wonderful Messianic prophecies that were fulfilled from the book of Zechariah. Beyond that, in English, the language is, is wonderful, as it is in all English Bibles. But the, the Hebrew in Zechariah is rich and powerful, and the imagery is great. So I would urge you sometime on your own time, not during my sermon, uh, read the book of Zechariah and pray your way through it. We're going to turn to Zechariah chapter 4, and I'm going to begin reading at verse 6. Now, I mentioned to you on, on last Sunday that uh, sometimes the version of the Bible that you read from makes a wee bit of difference because some of the translations are just different. It doesn't mean something is wrong particularly. In fact, if you'll read from several translations, then you can uh, sometimes get a, a richer view of a word. But there is a word in Zechariah chapter 4 which is translated, in my opinion, oddly, in some of the modern translations. The KJV, which I prefer, uh, we've already established that I'm old, um, but the KJV translates this word, it's the Hebrew word can, it should be translated in my view, grace, and the KJV translates it, grace. But if you look at your Bible, and some, if you're reading from a different version, some have left out the word grace, and have translated it something like, God bless it. Okay, I mean, that's kind of the same, isn't it? If God graces something, then he, then he blesses it. But I just prefer the word grace, and so that's the way I'll read it. If it sounds different than what you're looking at, mine is right. No, I'm just, I'm joking. All right, here we go. Zechariah chapter 4, beginning with verse 6. Then he answered and spoke unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel um, is, the, is an Old Testament type. Not many people talk about types anymore, but Zerubbabel is an Old Testament type for Jesus, the Prince of Restoration. Then he answered and spoke unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Who art thou, O great mountain? All right, pause a moment. In prophetic writing, mountain may mean all kinds of things. What it almost never means is mountain. It can mean an agency of force, a, a power, um, an army or a tyrant or a kingdom, something like that. Who art thou, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, thou shalt become a plain. Okay, here's the revised Rutland translation. Who do you think you are, kingdoms and, tyrant and tyrants? Who do you think you are, armies? Who do you think you are, geopolitical forces of the present age? When Jesus shows up, you'll be as flat as a tortilla. <laughs> Thou shalt become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings, crying, Grace, grace unto it. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also finish it. Is, doesn't that sound New Testament? God, who hath begun a good work in you, also will complete it, will perform it. He who hath laid, his hands has laid the foundation of this temple, his hands shall also complete it. Now, if you will, put your hands on your Bible, and let's pray together. Heavenly Father, with our hands upon the word and our hearts and minds as open as we know how to get them, we're asking you to do all the rest. Come, Holy Spirit, brush aside every barrier to divine communication. That when we leave here today, we will say, surely we have heard from the Lord. In the mighty name, Jesus, the strong Son of God. Amen. Amen. I am a lifetime student of the discipline of communication. I have devoted myself to understanding communication. What makes it work? When it doesn't work, what went wrong? When it works, what, what connected? Uh, in, in linguistics, in radio and television, mass media, in, in books, 19 books, 
I, I've tried to understand communication. Now I know what some of you are thinking. If he spent his life studying communication, it seems like he'd be better at it. But you don't know how bad I might have been. Here's what I've learned. Were one to boil the entire discipline of communication for a thousand years, the creme d'essence that would rise to the top is simply four things. The right message to the right party in the right way at the right time. The right message to the right party in the right way at the right time. Get any of those variables wrong, and it can all go wrong, really wrong, really fast. I heard about a married couple that were born on the same day. It's very rare that a married couple share a birthday. And not only that, they were married on their 23rd birthday. On their 40th wedding anniversary, which would have been their 63rd birthday, they took a, a second honeymoon to Tahiti. They're walking on the beach when a, a bottle washed up in the surf. The lady plucked the bottle from the waves and pulled out the cork, and out came a huge genie. And the genie said, you freed me from the bottle. I'll grant you each one free wish. The lady never hesitated. She said, I want a diamond ring bigger than Elizabeth Taylor's. The genie said, your wish is my command. And poof, on her finger, a ring, I mean, bigger than the star of India, gleaming in the South Pacific sunshine. The husband, now inspired, said, I want my wish. The genie said, your wish is my command. He said, I want a wife who's 30 years younger than I am. And poof, just like that, he was 93. I don't know why women like that joke so much. I... You can think that you're communicating clearly. But what you say may not be what the other person hears. One of the problems can, be, can just be the transition of language. The language is changing. Everybody in the same room speaking the same language, and they're from different generations. Words can simply change but their meaning. I, I see a lot of young people here this morning. and I just want to give you a word of prophecy. If you should live to my age... And Jesus tarries, there are words that you use now that you'll still use when you're in your 70s, but they won't mean the same thing. I wonder if there's anybody here, I think I'm probably the oldest person in the room, but is there anybody here that remembers when gay meant happy? Does anybody, I want gay back. Who stole gay? When I was a kid, gay meant happy. It, it was about disposition. It wasn't about orientation. I'd go to a party. I'd come home at night. My mother would say, hey, how was the party? I said, wonderful. Everybody there was gay. <laughs> she wasn't worried. We were just happy. What about the Christmas song? Don't you remember? Don We Now, Our Gay Apparel? That doesn't mean Christmas and drag. It means we're just happy at the birth of Christ. I went to preach uh, to a high school convention, high school age convention in California, which is evidently where the English language will be destroyed. And I don't know when I've ever spoken to an audience that was so enthused from the, from almost from the opening word, there's thousands of high school kids, they were just with me. Afterward, I was speaking to a group of boys right down in front of the stage, and the first boy said, Dr. Mark, he said, you are one bad preacher. In my lifetime, <laughs> bad has come to mean good. The second boy said, you're not just bad. He said, you're the baddest preacher I've ever heard. <laughs> baddest is not even a word in the English language. The third boy said, you're not just bad. He said, you are one sick dude. <laughs> One can only sense my level of personal affirmation. The fourth boy was not content with these low-altitude compliments. He said, you are not bad. You're not sick. He said, you are the OG of crunk. I have no clue. I teach the National Institute of Christian Leadership. Pastors come from all over the world to attend. One was a young man named Tommy. I 
And now he pastors what is called a hip-hop church, whatever that is. And so I figured Tommy would know. I called him. I said, Tommy, somebody just told me I was the OG of crunk. What can it mean? He said, oh, OG stands for original gangster. I said, so I'm the original gangster of crunk? He said, yes. I said, no. See, Tommy, what I'm looking for is, is how to understand it. I, did, I don't know what it means. Oh, he said, I assumed you knew what crunk means. I said, no. See, I don't. He said, it means you beat a Mac Daddy. I said, Tommy, look. What I'm after here falls along the lines of, of life a, like a definition. He said, oh, he said, I'm trying, Dr. Mark. He said, it means you'll be off the chain. I just decided to leave it alone. Now, when that happens to any word, there is some level of tragedy attached. But when it happens to our functional biblical vocabulary, when it happens to the words with which we think about God and therefore talk to each other about God, our apprehension of who God is and how he operates in our lives may be warped around our misunderstanding of the words. Many years ago, I used to preach uh, what was called the Minneapolis Soul Fest. We'd go every summer and uh, do an outdoor street crusade in Minneapolis. Set up a big platform, great huge banks of speakers, and uh, blast the music out about nine decibels above the level where all the birds drop dead. And, and we'd get a crowd and preach and everything. So the people who came forward, the platform was about this high. So the people who came forward just stood at the platform, and the people who ministered to them would kneel on the edge. One, I looked down, and one person was here right in front of the pulpit, and she had her head right against the edge of the, and her hair had fallen down, so nobody could see her. And I realized none of the altar workers were coming to her, so I came around the pulpit and knelt down, and I said, young lady, do you want me to pray with you? She, she never looked up. She said, yes, I need help. I said, you want the Lord to come in your life? She said, yes. I said, all right, pray with me. Pray with me right out loud. I'm going to say the words, and you repeat them. And I began, Heavenly Father. And she didn't say anything. I said, Miss, look, I, I'm not communicating. I'm going to say the words, and then you say them out loud. Pray with me. Dear Father. She didn't say anything. I said, Miss, what is, what's the problem? The first time she looked up, this eye was swollen completely shut. She had a horrible bruise that ran down across her streak, her cheek like streaks of purple. And her lip was split right there till I could see her teeth. Tears streaming down her little battered face. She said, you know, mister, I got all the father I can handle. And I realized she wasn't resistant to God. She didn't understand the word father. Now, here is a word which has come to mean almost everything and therefore has come to mean next to nothing. And that's the word grace. We use the word grace like agape mayonnaise. If you slop enough of it on anything, it can make rancid ham taste good. But what does, what does grace mean in the Bible? The righteous shall live by faith, yes. But what does grace mean? What about grace? We talk about the grace of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. What does grace mean? Fascinating to me as a New Testament believer that one of the richest and most beautiful images of grace in the whole Bible is in the Old Testament. Am I, am I the only one? I tend to think of grace as an e peculiarly or maybe exclusively New Testament reality, that the Old Testament's about law and the New Testament's about grace. But that's not true. There's references to grace all over the Old Testament. And here in the book of Zechariah, the image is this. The image is of us on one side of a huge mountain. And our Savior God is on the other side. And he wants to move this mountain. He wants this mountain moved out of between us. 
so that where it was, there will, instead of a mountain, there will be a plain, a flat place. And there he's going to build a temple, a tabernacle, where, as Moses said, where I will meet with you. Now, we're on this side saved. We know we're saved. We know we're saved. If there's any verse of scripture in the Bible that is sacrosanct in the evangelical world, it is this, no man is saved by works lest any man should boast, but we're saved by faith through grace and that not of ourselves. In other words, even the faith to believe for salvation is a work of grace. The problem is that we so often see it as an historical event. I receive grace for salvation. My name's in the Lamb's book. My sins are under the blood. I know I'm saved, and if I were to die now, I'd go to heaven. Now I've had grace. Now I turn and face this mountain in my life, and I'm going to take possession of and responsibility for this mountain. I'm going to move this mountain. So that on the other, Jesus who has saved me is now on the other side of the mountain that we can have the face-to-face -face intimate relationship that I want and cannot have while this mountain remains in my life. Now, what is the mountain? It's different in every life. It can be hurt, anger, resentment, unforgiveness, racial prejudice, lust, fear, addiction, whatever it is. It's different in every life, but that thing in my life that nags at me, that, that accuses me, that sneers at me, that says you can't have the relationship with your Savior, that you think, that's, when I take possession of that, I'm going to move this mountain. Shoulder to the wheel, nose to the grindstone. This year, I'll be a better Christian if it kills me. <laughs> the only problem is what? It'll kill you. If it doesn't put you right straight in a religious loony bin first, rocking back and forth in a straight jacket and humming Jesus loves me. Because you'll never move this mountain. That's exactly what the Bible says. It's not by your might. It's not by your power. So we hammer at the mountain. We dig on it. It's impregnable. It's unassailable. We can't get around it. We can't get under it. And so finally... Some people, every one of you in this room, I suspect, knows somebody that does this. Collapses at the foot of the mountain and says, all right, I'm leaving. They leave the church. They leave faith. They go home. And what they, they cover it with all kinds of anger. And they say, I don't like the church. I didn't like the music. Drummer, crazy, <laughs> loud. I don't like the, these children leading worship. I don't like this. I don't like the preacher. It was too hot. It was too cold. No, no. All of those are deceptions. They are frustrated with their own failure to reach perfection. And they say, I, in a kind of mistaken, um, kind of mistaken or warped sense of perfectionism, they say, I won't go to church with this mountain in my life. So what do they do? They stay home with the mountain in their lives. And the mountain continues its destructive force. Others take a different approach. They drape the mountain in camouflage. They drag the mountain behind them in camo-draped ball and chain, coming across the parking lot of Spearfield churches, meeting other people dragging their camo-draped bondages, and we enter into a mutually agreed-upon covenant of suspended disbelief. Do you see my mountain? Nay, brother, thou hast no mountain. What about me? No mountain there. Let's go to church. <laughs> and in the spiritual realm above our heads, an unresolved sierra of mountains. Others, and fortunately it's most of us, collapse at the foot of the mountain and cry out, Lord, I can't move this mountain. I quit. Do you hear me? I quit. What we think is that from the other side of the mountain, we're going to get a tongue lashing. Because we've projected onto Jesus the face, voice, and personality of our high school football coach. So they think he's going to yell at us, you big fat sissy. If you can't play with pain, you can't play on the Jesus team. Pull your socks up and hit that mountain again. I played high school football 
right at the end of the Civil War. I remember, <laughs> so rude to laugh. Um, I don't think there's anybody here old enough to remember. Any men here old enough to remember, in small high schools, they didn't have platoon football. You didn't have offensive and defensive players. And I went to a small high school. There were only 19 boys. You just put your helmet on and played till you died. <laughs> but uh, I played quarterback on offense, but on defense, I played free safety. And I dreaded our inner squad scrimmages more than any game we played because the coach's son was our tailback, and he was the most vicious and lethal runner I've ever attempted to bring down. If he got into the deep secondary, he came at you like a buzzsaw and all full of knees and helmets and demons. And I was, I was a gentleman. I didn't want to impede Bobby's path to glory. I would have escorted him into the end zone. But he was on a search and destroy mission. Bobby would chase me. <laughs> Finally, I said to him, Bobby, what is up with you? I've brought down bigger guys than you. I hate tackling you. He said, you want to know what's up with me? Come home with me after school. Nobody went home with Bobby. Because he was not only a vicious and lethal runner, he was a vicious and lethal human being. We were all scared of him. So I went home with him after school, and we went in the garage. He pulled the garage door down, and he said, there's your answer. About waist high, the garage door looked like somebody had been hitting him with a sledgehammer. He said, when I started the sixth grade, my football coach dad put a helmet on my head, made me bend over at the waist and run into that garage door with all my might. And he said, I've hit it every single day, birthday, Christmas, New Year's, every day, 365 days a year since I started the sixth grade. And any day I didn't hit it hard enough to please him, he'd take a braided whistle strap and hit my legs. He said, you run into a garage door every day for about seven years, and a 160-pound cornerback just don't look like much. No wonder he was a vicious runner. No wonder he was a vicious human being. That is emotional child abuse of the worst order. That's a father attempting his son to, forcing his son to attempt that, which they both know is impossible. And all of that youthful, adolescent, male angst building up inside of him, which he takes and focuses on the opposition on the field for his own glory as a coach. Shame, shame. Is that your Jesus? Because if that's your Jesus, your Jesus is my devil. Coming behind us with the braided whistle strap of Protestant works righteousness, pray better, fast more, win more people to me. And the ministry, by the way, is not exempt. There are more than one pastor trying to preach good enough, raise enough money, build enough buildings to get to avoid the whistle strap of Jesus who stands behind the pulpit. That is not Jesus. So we fall at the foot of the mountain and we cry out, I quit. What do you have to say to that? But from the other side of the mountain comes words we never thought we'd hear. Good. That's what I've been waiting on, was for you to quit. Now stand back. And then the Bible says Jesus shouts. It's a remarkable passage. He says he shouts. What does he shout? Do better. Learn the law. Memorize the rules. No, he doesn't shout at us at all. He shouts at the mountain. And what does he shout? Grace! Grace! And the mountain melts like wax. The liberal humanist will tell you that grace means God doesn't care about the mountain. That he nudges the angels in the ribs and winks and says, well, boys will be boys. But that condemns us to the destructiveness of the mountain. The legalist says that grace means God will finally make you strong enough to destroy the mountain. But that condemns us to frustration because the Bible is clear. You will never get strong enough. Your might will never be great enough to move that mountain. What grace means is God wants the mountain out of your life, but he wants to move it himself. So the issue is not getting strong enough. The issue is getting surrendered enough. 
Now the problem is we take possession of the mountain. We take the responsibility. I'm going to move this mountain. When we do that, we, can I use a phrase? We disgrace ourselves. We degrace ourselves. We ungrace ourselves. And all that anger and frustration building up inside of us. There are disgraceful churches. Whole churches that are disgraceful. The grace is oozed out. And what's left is this angry, judgmental frustration. I pastored, the last church I pastored was a huge church in Orlando, Florida, 8,000 members. And you think when you pastor a church of 8,000, one person being angry at you won't matter. It still stings. So I was out in the lobby one day shaking hands. This guy came up to me. He was so mad he could hardly talk plain. He said, I'm, I'm leaving the church. I said, why? He said, because of the lie that you told in the pulpit today. I said, what lie? He said, I heard you. I heard you. You lied. I said, what are you talking about? He said, you talked about a certain battle that happened in World War I, and you said that battle happened in 1917. He said, I happen to be an expert in American military history, and I know that battle didn't happen until early 1918. He said, a man that a lie about a thing like that would lie about anything. And I can't go to church where there's a liar in the pulpit. I said, well, bye. <laughs> no, I mean, adios. I cannot help you with that. That's disgraceful. That is disgraceful. Let me tell you about another man in the same church, though. This is my friend, an attorney. He's still my friend. We talk on the phone. Every time I preached, morning, night, Wednesday night, every time I preached, all the years I was there, he'd come up to me after every sermon and say, oh, Dr. Rutland, that's the greatest sermon I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> now, I was born at night, but I wasn't born last night. I know at the cognitive level, I know nobody can preach the definitive Christian masterpiece three times a week. I know that, but I like that lawyer lying to me. <laughs> when I came out of the pulpit, I was looking for that attorney. I wanted some grace. Now I know what you're thinking. When the new pastor gets here, whoever he is, whenever that comes, we can't do that. Poor grace on him. Grace, oh, his ego will get all, go on, pump him up. There'll be some mean old lady in the lobby with a pen. She'll pop him. <laughs> After more than a half a century in the ministry, I am now persuaded that the entire race of Christians is divided into only two tribes, pumpers and poppers. I believe that God is looking for a church full of pumpers in order to pour out his grace. So start now preparing yourself that you are going to grace the next pastor. That the church will be a church full of grace. We don't only disgrace our churches, we disgrace our own families. We pick and pry at each other over non-essentials. I was the president of a substantial university in the Midwest. One day a, a father came to see me and he had thousands of students. I don't know all their names, but I happened to know his son as soon as he said the kid's name. I said, oh, I know your son. What a wonderful boy. He's a real Christian leader on this campus. He said, I know, I know. That's not why I'm here. I said, well, why are you here? He said, I'll tell you exactly why I'm here. He said, it's that earring. He said, I want you to make him take that earring out. He said, I can't stand the sight of it. Every time I see him, all I can see is that earring. I want you to make him take it out. I wanted to say, sir, you had him 18 years. I've had him three semesters. Why is it my job? But you know what? I felt he wasn't at a place to hear that. The next day, I called the boy in my office. I said, do you know who was here yesterday? He said, oh, yeah. I know exactly who was here. I know why he was here. He wants you to make me take this earring out. I said, son, your dad is a piece of work. 
He said, Dr. Rutland is destroying our relationship. Nothing but an earring. He said, it's destroying our relationship. It's so stupid. I said, it is stupid. He said, now let something like that, an earring, stand between you and somebody you love. I said, wasn't that stupid? He said, it is stupid. Oh, he said, I know what you're doing. (laughs) I said, look, son, one of you is going to have to be a grown-up. And I met your dad. (laughs) He said, you know, I never thought about it from my side. He said it was always just about my dad being judgmental. I never thought about it from my side. He said, you're right. I've never been so proud of a college boy in my life. He reached up, took that earring out, placed it on my coffee table. He said, my dad will never see that again. Now look, I'm old. Boys wearing earrings. Can I, I still struggle. Am I the only one? You ever just want Take that out of your ear and give it to your sister. Uh, (laughs) On the other hand, on the other hand, are we willing to disgrace relationships that we care about over non-essentials like that? Pride our family, criticize, judge them over how they cut their hair or what they wear or just picking at each other until we disgrace the entire relationship. It's not just, not just the parents. Kids disgrace their parents all the time. They disgrace their parents, judging them, angry at them, embarrassed by their parents. You ever see these families come into a restaurant, three of them, mother, father, and a little boy about maybe nine or ten, and they get a table of four instead of three, and about five minutes later, the teenage son comes in. <laughs> I'm not with these people. They kidnapped me. (laughs) And he kind of turns his chair sideways and sits at the table like this. What he wants everybody to think is he's not with them. But what everybody in the restaurant is thinking, he looks just like his dad. (laughs) If he could just find grace, if he could just come in and say, this is my family. The little fat man with no hair, that's my dad. And my future. (laughs) The chubby little lady with gray hair. She used to change my diapers. The little boy biting on his arm. That's my brother. If he could find grace, it makes him look more attractive. If he could only see that. We're, We're not allowed to disgrace our families. Worst of all, we disgrace ourselves. We live in a constant flow of self-condemnation over things that don't even matter. We stare into the full-length mirror of self-evaluation, and we despise what we say, what we see. We say, look at you. What happened to you? Where did your hair go? And whence cometh this fat? Until we can find God's grace for who we are at every stage of our lives, each stage, we keep thinking the next stage will be better, the next stage will be better, but we keep taking disgrace with us into the next stage. I had a group of teenagers one time talking about a lady in their church that said, Dr. Rutland, she's the most sour pistol woman we've ever known. What, is, what, what happened to her? I said, nothing happened to her. She was sour puss when she was your age. She just got more puss sour as she went along. I said, when you're a teenager, you cover it with makeup and beauty and all that kind of thing. You get older, all that's gone. And what's left? Just disgraceful. (laughs) So we carry the disgrace with us into the next life. We We disgrace our marriages all the time. We disgrace our marriages. We've been married 50, this summer, July the 5th, you can remember that and send me a million dollars. July the 5th will be 57 years of marriage. Amen. I know your applause is for my wife. You're thinking she's endured a lot. When I 
leave to go on the road, traveling some godforsaken foreign country, Michigan or someplace. And, <laughs> and my wife will, before I go to the airport, she'll put her hands on my face and she'll say, oh, Mark, you are the handsomest, sexiest thing I've ever seen. Look, look up here. <laughs> I live in the real world. But a lawyer and a wife who will both lie to you is grace. <laughs> Look, ladies, I'm going to tell you something. Your husband is like God in one way. I saw one lady in the back said, this is why I came, right here. No, it's true. The Bible says that God has numbered the hairs on your husband's head. So has your husband. And he does not need you to remind him that the number is diminishing annually. He wants grace. She also wants grace, brother. When she walks out with that dress on that she bought at the mall, she, doesn't, she says, look what I bought. She's modeling it for you. She doesn't want you to peer over the top of the sports page. I'm going to say, that set me back. I'm going to confiscate your credit card. She walks out with that dress on. She's modeling it for you. You throw that newspaper aside and jump to your feet and say, Whoa, Whoa woman, look at you. You wear that on Wednesday night, and we're going to be late to prayer meeting. Now, that's grace. That's grace. A marriage that is filled with grace. Our lives filled with grace. Churches that are filled with grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that pours out an affirmative, gracious generosity. Grace gives more. Grace does more. Grace goes beyond. I was talking with a guy the other day about tithing. He said, I don't believe in tithing. I don't know what you teach here. I know what I believe. He said, I don't believe in tithing. He said, that's Old Testament. That's, that's the law. We're under grace. I said, I didn't think of it that way. You are 100% right. He said, well, I'm glad to hear you say that. I said, now, here's my question, sir. Does grace do less than the law or more than the law? He said, you know, I think I am under the law. <laughs> <laughs> Gracious, spirit-filled, generous, loving, affirming family amidst other such families create a church that is generous and loving and grace-filled. And that is what God wants. Well, you've been very patient. And uh, I've decided you're such a jolly church. I'm going to tell you the funniest church story that I've ever heard in my whole life. I'm ready to close. You can't tell this everywhere. <laughs> Trust me. But I'm going to tell you. You know the funniest stuff in the world happens in church, right? You're not living in denial, are you? And the funniest churches in the world are spirit-filled. I think it ought to be a question for ordination. Say, do you know what's funny for us, and can you give some examples? If they don't know, don't ordain them. So I have a friend of mine who's a pastor. I can't vouch for the veracity of the story. He is, after all, a preacher. But he swears it's true. He said he invited an evangelist to preach at his church. And a lady in the church came to him and said she had a word from God that the evangelist wasn't supposed to come. And he, he said what he should have said. He said, now, sister, I'm, I haven't heard from God. That I felt God told me that he'd come. Until he tells me, he's still coming. But you don't have to come. You don't have to affirm it, anything. But until the Lord speaks to me, he's coming. Well, she wouldn't leave well enough alone, would she? They never do. They've all got the red phone to heaven. So the first night of the revival, the evangelist had been preaching about five minutes when that lady stepped out in the center aisle, raised up her hand, pointed her finger in the evangelist's face and said, Whoa, thus saith the Lord, thou thinkest that thou art a humdinger. But thou art not a humdinger, saith the Lord, thou art a dinger. I said, my God. Pastor, what did you do? He said, Dr. Rutland, I froze at the controls. He said, nothing had prepared me for that moment. And he said, I just froze. He said, it was the evangelist that saved the day. He looked at her for a moment, put his head over on the pulpit and burst out laughing. 
And people started laughing over here and over here. Laughter will feed itself in a church. Then the musicians started laughing. That's usually where the problem is. And <laughs> the laughter just, when it reached a crescendo, that old lady grabbed her Bible, went up the, out the, when she got under the exit sign, she lifted her hand and said, I'll never darken the doors of this church again. The pastor said, Dr. Utland, it was the hour of deliverance. <laughs> now, here's the ironic thing. That old lady was actually right about one thing. She was right about one thing. Thou art not a humdinger. Look up here, everybody. Look, all the on this side. Thus saith the Lord. Thou art not humdingers. Thou art dingers. Look up here, you all. Everybody, you need this. Thou art dingers too. Thus saith the Lord. Thou hast done dinger stuff. Thou art not finished. But, saith the Lord, I see thee in thy dingerness, and I love thee just the same. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that great? Think of the useless, fruitless, futile effort emotionally, psychologically, and spiritually that we spend trying to convince everybody else that we're humdingers, and nobody believes it anyway. If we can just look into the mirror of God's redemptive grace and say, hey, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ is with you. All right, I'll, I'll close. Here we go. Suppose somebody came in here today, knew nothing about Christianity. Nothing. And they said, tell me about Christianity. We said, well, here's the Bible. Read the whole Bible. And they read the whole thing. Faith begins to build up inside of them. They begin to get hope. They begin to think this could work. They come to the last verse of the Bible. The last thing any, anybody says to you is important. What if they come to the last verse in the Bible and it says, I was joking about all that stuff. I hate all of you. Thus saith the Lord. That would be pretty discouraging, wouldn't it? Or what if it says, I'm going to let some of you come to heaven and the rest of you are going to hell and I'm not going to tell you how I choose. That's frightening, isn't it? They come to the last page of the Bible, the last verse of the last page, and the whole Bible ends. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. All of you. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. All the way all the time, all the way to heaven. Well, let's pray. If you'll bow your heads and close your eyes. I want to pray first for any of you that want prayer. I'm not going to give an altar call or anything, but where you are. And then I want to pray over this sweet church. If you would say, Dr. Mark, will you please pray for me? To every head bowed and I close, please give everybody else privacy. Just say, I don't know where it happened. I don't know where the grace drained out of my life. I don't know how I got so judgmental and angry. I don't know where this happened. Will you pray that God will refill the reservoir of grace in my life? The people around me that need grace and not anger. If that's you, then you lift your hand up and take it right back down. And I want to pray for you. Yes. Yes. Sure. Yes. It's so easy to let it happen. We don't mean to. We don't even know how it happened. A damage, a wound, a hurt, something. And the grace just oozes out. Anybody else? Let's lift your hand and put it right there. Sure, sure. Yes, all right. All right, yes, all right, son, I see you there. Heavenly Father, we lift these lives and our own lives to you. Grace us. Refill the reservoir of grace in our lives. That it will flow out across those around us. That they will feel that the presence of the Lord has come in the room when we arrive. That they will find joy and forgiveness and redemption because we have. Come Holy Spirit. We give you the mountains in our lives. We surrender everything to you. We ask you to do it all. It's not by might nor by power but by your spirit. 
Now, still with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I'd like to pray over this church. Heavenly Father, I pray that you will guide to this church the leadership that you have in mind. That you will give the board wisdom and grace and discernment and give the congregation unity and faith. We thank you, God. We see great things ahead for this church. Growth in numbers and in spirit and in grace. Leadership that takes this church to the next level. We receive it by faith. We know that you have exactly the right person, exactly the right family. But we, we await their presence. Come Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, everybody. Can we give Dr. Rudlin a big round of applause for coming the last two weeks? Yes, thank you, thank you, yes, thank you so much, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, truly. My name is Miles Walker, and I'm a member of the church here, and um, I'm, I'm speechless, I don't know what to say. I, I hope you all understand, sorry, I always cry when I get up here, it's so embarrassing. <laughs> I hope you all understand better when I, if you heard me speak last month up here, why I said when they, Jay showed and the board showed a picture of Dr. Rutherford and said he was coming, why I said, thank God I'm not preaching the week after Dr. Rutherford coming. <laughs> I hope you understand yeah. now after hearing that today. That was a humble, honest statement. I just want to say thank, thank you, Dr. Rutherford. I get a, the privilege today of just giving a shout out to two group of people who've made an impact on my life today. The first is Dr. Rutland. And I just wanted to say, I mentioned this to him last week when he came, that if you heard me speak last month, when my wife and I moved here 22 years ago, um, I was in a very rough place. And I told you how I was wandering around uh, like a person with an arm blown off and in rough shape. Um, and at times would wake up in the morning and I think the question was, God, am I saved today? I'm really not sure. And honestly, um, not ever having you met Dr. Rudland, God used him mightily in my life through all the books that he wrote, uh, the series of small books he wrote about dreams, about nevertheless, about his testimony, hearing him preach at Rock Eagle, my wife and I going to the marriage conferences more than one time. God used him to build up my faith and move me in the right direction, and I want to thank you for that. So God bless you. For that. And... Uh, as a church, we want to, I know as we say this, we cannot say enough, we want to sincerely thank you for coming the last two weeks and for being a part of our pastor search. That shows a lot of grace to us, and we are truly grateful to you for that. Uh, secondly, uh, I would like to give a shout out to, to uh, I'm going to cry again. So embarrassing. <laughs> I'd like to thank Greg and Debbie Mervich today. And the reason that I'm giving a shout out for their class that they're doing to, starting tomorrow night and for the next three weeks. I just want to say, when they met, when Greg met me 30 years ago, I was a, uh, I'd just gotten saved. I was, a, <laughs> I'm laughing, I was a highly dysfunctional person. <laughs> I truly was a highly dysfunctional person. God saved me. He gave me a call of God on my life, put me through Bible college, and gave me a job working in a Christian school. And I think Greg was thinking, what have you given me here to work with? I just want to say, Greg took me aside and worked with me and mentored me and still mentors me after 30 years and taught, he took me aside. I worked on a teacher's salary and living in California on $15,000, my wife and I in California, um, and she did not work when we had our two children and we, when we went, lived completely debt free in California for a long time. Um, and almost all of it was because of the principles that Greg taught me and Debbie taught us. Man, 30 years ago, I have been a school teacher for 30 years. We still live. God takes care of every single need. I use the principles that Greg had taught me 30 years ago. God is unbelievably faithful. I don't have time to go into it, but I just want to say, give them a plug. I know that some of you signed up for their course the next three Mondays. Please sign up and listen to them speak. These are people who have tremendous wisdom in the Lord and tremendous practical knowledge of finance and things about the kingdom of God. 
don't dismiss this it's a really really great opportunity to hear from people who have a rich history with the lord so i encourage you please come to that i know my wife signed up i because of my school i'm not sure if i'll be able to come but thank you again thank you to greg and debbie i hope you don't mind giving me a shout out they have blessed me in so many ways and i just want to thank them for that we're going to form a pray and dismiss you thank you so much for all coming today god bless you lord we thank you for your goodness for your mercy and for your grace lord jesus father we thank you we invite you as we start 2024 to lead us guide us we pray for the board give them wisdom and grace father we thank you for everything they're doing be with us as we go in jesus name amen